In today's episode, I start to look at one of the most common and widely used measures of risk adopted by investment banks and hedge fund managers, and how we, as retail traders, can start to take advantage of this ourselves in our trading processes. And the risk management technique I'm referring to is value at risk. Stay tuned. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. As a trader, you'll benefit from cost-effective market access via multiple trading platforms and APIs. These enable trading and investing in any US stock over 60 of the most liquid futures contracts, FX and CFDs. You can even diversify your portfolio by buying and selling other traders' strategies as investable assets themselves. So, if all of that sounds interesting, learn more by clicking on the link top right now or find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. Value at risk is used by investment banks, hedge funds, mutual funds and a multitude of other financial services organisations to measure and help manage risk. It's one of the main underpinning concepts behind the FRM certifications for financial risk management that many investment banks look for from prospective candidates. So how can we as traders use this to inform our decision making? Let's take a look. So value at risk really is a de facto method that large hedge funds and investment banks use to measure what I call instantaneous risk, the risk of a portfolio at any point in time. And value at risk, or VAR, as you often see it abbreviated, is covered in detail in a multitude of financial risk management certifications. And also those of you that are familiar with DarwinX will have come across value at risk before, because this is what's used to measure the risk of individual traders strategies and also used by the DarwinX risk engine in order to standardize the risk of the investable assets based on those strategies, Darwin's. And this is the fundamental metric that's used for those calculations. But what is value at risk? Well, it's a financial risk metric, and it's based very heavily on statistical methods. And really, it's used to measure the amount of potential loss that could happen over a specified period of time. And more than that, provides a probability of losing more than a given amount in that predefined time span. When calculating value at risk, you're presented with a number of questions about how the metric should be configured. And the answer to those questions, of course, depends on the context of the use. But the main metrics for consideration are the specified amount of loss, and that's either as a monetary value or as a percentage of the entire fund value, the time period over which the risk is assessed, and finally, what's called the confidence interval. So let's use an example to illustrate this. And the example I'm going to use are the metrics that are used by DarwinX. So here, a Darwin, which if you remember is this investable asset based on a trader's strategy, is configured to have a monthly value at risk of 6.5% with a 95% statistical confidence. So we've got all of those three metrics I just mentioned on the previous slide here. We've got the amount of risk, which is 6.5%. We've got the time span, which in this case is monthly. And we've got this statistical confidence at 95%. And what this means is that in a Darwin, you can expect to lose 6.5% or more in one month out of 20 months or in other words, 5% of the time. But of course, the converse of that means that 95% of the time, or 19 months out of 20, the same investment will make more than minus 0.65%. 
And hopefully many of those months, of course, will be positive returns. And the good thing about value at risk is that it provides very concise information to investors in funds so that they know what they should expect in terms of risk of their investment. Now, like many things, there are multiple ways of calculating value at risk. The main three are what are known as the historical method. And this is really useful when you have individual assets. So for example, you could calculate the value at risk for the NASDAQ or the S&P 500, or also portfolios that tend to remain fairly consistent. So you can look at that historical information and because the portfolio isn't going to change very much, that value at risk should then be applicable to the future also. However, this historical method is not good if portfolios are constantly changing, because how can you base a future risk assessment on something that doesn't look like it looked in the past? So that's the context within which you'd use this method. But as you can probably guess, this probably isn't the best way that we as traders could calculate VAR because our portfolios will be constantly changing on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, the next method is what's known as the Monte Carlo method. And as it happens, this is the technique used by Darwin X. And here, there are thousands of simulations that are run based on the type of behavior in the past of a particular trader's strategy. And it plays out different simulations of what could happen in the future. And then based on those thousands of simulations, that provides the information in order to calculate a value at risk. But there's a third method known as the parametric method. Sometimes this is called the variance covariance method. And this really comes into its own when the current combination of the positions that make up the portfolio have never been seen before. So we might be holding a combination of six or seven positions. And because that's not been encountered before, we can't really look to historical information and historical behavior to help us with what the level of value at risk is. But this method does not need to know that. As long as we have certain information that's critical for the calculation, we can still calculate a value at risk. But before we make a final decision about which of these is most appropriate to short-term trading, let's again revisit the context and the objective for us as a trader. First and foremost, we want to be able to measure the impact on the risk of our portfolio, or in other words, the change in risk of adding a specific new position into that existing portfolio. So we need, if you like, to calculate two value at risk levels, one without the new position and one with. And then based on that information, as we saw last time, that can then inform whether or not it makes sense for that position to be allowed to open or not. Or the alternative scenario that we looked at was, is there a position size that optimizes the overall return and risk ratio for the portfolio that we need to use for this new position? And so I hope you agree that coming back to the three different techniques used to calculate value at risk, it's this parametric method that is by far the best option for that context. So with that decided, we can now start to think about which VAR metrics make most sense for us. And this is going to be determined by a number of factors. And indeed, there will be different answers for different traders. So for example, in terms of defining risk tolerances and maximum risk levels, this will be very much dependent on your individual risk appetite and tolerance to risk. It will also be significantly impacted by your trading time frame. So if you're the kind of trader who might only open one new position each month, and those positions typically stay open for six months plus, then a monthly value at risk calculation, like the one used by Darwin X, might be the most appropriate for you. However, if you're like me and you have a much larger number of trades, and for me personally, 
they stay open for a matter of hours up to a few days, then maybe a daily value at risk is more appropriate. So note that the examples I use in future episodes will be based on a daily value at risk. So you just need to bear in mind if that's not appropriate for you, you'd need to change that to meet your own circumstances. Now, just one more thing before we finish off today, and that's to talk about what's known as incremental value at risk. This is an extension of the standard value at risk model that happens to be particularly useful for the context that I'll be talking about in terms of the use of value at risk. And this concept specifically looks at that change in risk that a new position would cause on a portfolio. And in many cases, it's this metric that will drive that decision making that answers the question, will a new position be allowed or not? And to understand the full implications of this, we have to shift our thinking from that of individual position risk to portfolio risk. So there might be an individual position that actually has an extremely high value at risk in its own right. But taking this approach, does that mean we shouldn't take the trade? Well, no, not necessarily, because if it is negatively correlated with the existing portfolio, it could actually reduce the overall portfolio risk. So it's this complete mind shift in terms of how we think about risk that we need to get our heads around in order to use this technique successfully. In this example where it did reduce the overall portfolio risk, that means that the incremental VAR value will be negative. The risk has gone down. Whereas if a highly correlated new position is added to the portfolio, that can increase the overall risk substantially. And so in this case, the incremental VAR will be positive. It will go up. So I'm hoping you've now got all of the background information about value at risk for us to go to the next stage. And the next stage is actually calculating it. So I really look forward to you joining me next time when I start to go through that calculation. In the meantime, if you want to find out more about Darwin X, you can click on the link that's bottom right now. But now until next time, trade safe.